Good morning, everyone. Welcome to this update for global stocks and commodities for the 10th of June. Uh, as everyone knows, since uh, February, we've had a uh, correction stroke consolidation in the market, which was to be expected after such a terrific run in 2017, and then really a, a blow-off top surge in uh, January of this year. Um, and that gives us a lot of a lot of noise. The market has been uh, jumping up and down. We've had several uh, erratic moves up and down over the last couple of months. And there's, um, there's just generally been a lot of noise in the market. But there are certain indicators that you can look at that help filter out a lot of that noise and, uh, and get you focused on what's really going on in the market. And one of those is the breadth of the market, which I'll explain when we get into this. And the market breadth is really telling us the story at the moment amongst all the, the volatility and the, the concerns and hand-wringing about what might be happening with North Korea or what might be happening uh, in Europe or with Italy or, you know, whatever it might be, there's always plenty of things out there that can cause the market to be uh, concerned. But certainly market breadth is, is telling us that there is an extremely positive tone out there at the moment. So let's jump in and uh, and have a look. So in this update, um, I just want to look at this this general concept that uh, you can filter a lot of things out, and uh, and the market breadth is telling us exactly what uh, what the market is doing, um, and we're seeing small caps outperform. I've been covering this over the last three or four weeks since the Russell 2000 broke to new all-time highs, and uh, it continues to outperform the other major indices. There's also been quite a clear change of character as well uh, from February through till. Um, late April, early May, and in particular from March, uh, March and April, what we saw was most of the sessions in the US, the, the indices were closing uh, fairly weakly. There was generally selling in the last hour or two of the market. That seems to have turned around now, and we're seeing uh, quite clearly that there's buying strength coming in uh, at the end of each uh, session day, and uh, and that's very telling. So clearly a change of character, and uh, and that's certainly um, you know consistent with what we're seeing with the market breadth. Uh, it's a normal stock and commodity uh, trend update, of course. And uh, portfolio analyst, um, there was some uh, there was some excellent questions asked last week, which I answered, and I also put forward a couple of. Possibilities. So there were some great lo local opportunities in um, in the Australian market last week, uh, and I also touched on again just this theme that is just the most powerful theme that you can use as a trader, and that's using the benefit of momentum, uh, staying with the strong strongest stocks in the strongest sectors. So the uh, the S and P was up by one point six for the week, so that was pretty good, and uh, the Russell and um, the Nasdaq. Uh, also at new all-time highs, so that's a first now for the for the Nasdaq, but of course the Russell had been there for um, for some weeks. Uh, also, the Dow had a very good week. I think it was up about three point eight percent. So uh, a big week for the Dow Jones. And there's just really been amazing breadth since March, considering we're in the middle of a consolidation. Normally, in these sort of corrective periods, it's the small cap stocks that often get hit fairly hard. But uh, that certainly has not been the case uh, this time around. Uh, we're finding at the moment that 68% um, of the S&P 500 stocks are trading above their 50-day moving average. Now, for those of you that are new to the market, you might think, well, so what? What does that mean? Uh, when a stock price is trading above its 50-day moving average, it's generally in a pretty strong uptrend, unless it's only just starting to uh, to basically turn up. Um, so to have such a, a high proportion, two thirds of the S&P stocks above their 50 day moving average is a real sign of strength, particularly when we're in the ninth year of a bull market. So, you know, clearly there are already strong big picture trends in place. And, um, and we've got two thirds of the market trading above a, a, a relatively short term uh, moving average, so a very positive sign. Uh, and the rising indices, so that whether it's the, the NASDAQ or the, the S&P or whatever it might be, the rising indices are being very well supported by breadth. 
Now, what happens when you get towards exhaustion in the market and we're heading towards a major top before we roll over into a bear market is that uh, the indices get held up by some of the big cap stocks. So you see the likes of Amazon and Apple and Google and Netflix. You see them continuing to uh, to go up and supporting holding the index up, but uh, most of the other stocks start to roll over in advance, and you actually see very weak market breadth. But at the moment, um, as you'll see on uh, on the next uh, slide, we're actually seeing the market breadth is actually uh, going faster. So it's rising faster than the actual indices are. So, uh, you know, I can tell you we're, uh, we're nowhere near a market top at, uh, at this point in time. However, short-term resistance looms fairly soon for the S&P. Markets have had a, a pretty good period um, in the short term. So I would expect to see a pause or some sort of small retracement just to work off that excess. But certainly the medium to longer term looks very, very positive. Now, the US dollar is slightly across the week, um, and that was partly because the euro found some stability and went up a bit now that sanity prevails in, uh, in Italy from the um, political sense. Um, but it's a very big week coming up, as I'll, uh, as I'll get to shortly. Uh, a lot of things could, uh, could move currencies and stock markets uh, considerably. So I'll just touch on this chart um, before we actually get into uh, the rest of the charts proper. So this is uh, what's called the advanced decline line, which is which is the line in red. So the line in blue is the S&P 500 index, and that's working off the left-hand index, or the left-hand axis, I should say. And on the right is the red, uh, the red axis, um, and that's the cumulative advanced decline line. And what that's basically uh, showing us is a, a running cumulative total of stocks advancing versus stocks declining. So you can see that normally the two of them are very much in step. So uh, during this uh, period here, um, from uh, the from the thirtieth of um, of the fifth, we had a uh, lengthy period where the S and P was heading up and you can see the red advanced decline line was pretty much in step with it. So we had rising index uh, and also a rising cumulative breadth line, which is what you want to see. And these two are normally, you know, pretty much aligned. Then when we got into, um, into February, uh, you can see that the S&P index came off very, very sharply. Um, the breadth fell a bit but nowhere near as much as the overall indices did. So that indicated that the selling was in or was not in a lot of the smaller stocks. And you can see that it very quickly regained its stability. And now we've got the breadth line um, has diverged considerably from the S&P. Um, so this is an enormously positive sign that the indices are going up, but the breadth is, um, is going up even more quickly. So a very good indicator to help filter out the noise. Okay, let's look at uh, the S&P now. You can see quite a, quite a strong week. Uh, we had a little pause on uh, Thursday, which was basically a flat day. But other than that, it was, uh, it was a very solid week. Here's the resistance at 2800. And then we've got uh, all time high resistance up here which was formed in January at uh, 2872. So I would expect that we will get some sort of little pause. We might even get a little bit of a pullback from this 2800 level. But, you know, I mean, that's just what markets do. Two or three steps forward and, and one step back. And you've, you've got to be um, prepared to work with that. And, and the little pullbacks are really your buying opportunities. You know, you don't want to be buying when the market's been going up for several weeks. You want to be buying when people start to, you know, get a bit fearful and and maybe uh, sell their stocks down. So that's the S&P. The NASDAQ, looking at the QQQ, you can see we just managed to form some new all-time highs. That occurred on, uh, on Wednesday, um, and that's still looking very positive. And despite the added volatility that we've seen since February, you can see that the rate of 
of uh, uptrend is the same as it was through 2017. Uh, it's just that the swings on either side of that trend line have become larger, but you can see they're settling down now. Uh, and finally, the Russell. So you can see we, we broke out on the Russell back on the 16th of May. Um, so that was um, three, three weeks ago, three and a half weeks ago. And uh, it's been clearly outperforming uh, the other indices. So extremely positive. Let's look at the US dollar. So we managed to run up to resistance and then pull back from that. Um, but with the Fed meeting uh, coming up this week and the likelihood that um, we'll see another interest rate rise at this meeting, then you've really got to conclude that the US dollar should head higher from here, particularly now that there are, um, there are growth concerns in Europe. Again, uh, it would appear that economically Europe is not growing um, uh, nearly as quickly as the US uh, is, and so that should uh, tend to put the brakes on the euro, which of course then by definition helps the US dollar. Okay, let's move on to the Australian market. Um, our dollar was a bit all over the place, got up into the mid to high 76s at one stage, but, uh, but eased again on Friday back down below the 76 mark, so it was quite a roller coaster week. Uh, our index rose uh, 55 points, um, just under 1% for the week. But look, the gains were pretty much in uh, energy and mining stocks. Um, there wasn't much else happening. Telecommunications, Telstra's uh, a bit of a lame duck. Uh, the banks uh, were flat, and uh, the banks, and in particular CBA, are really just hanging on by a thread. They've broken support but they haven't sort of really let go with a big rush yet. But uh, in my experience, that's, um, that's looking pretty inevitable that at some stage there's going to be a trigger that, that causes people to abandon, uh, you know, what has been an absolute favourite of the market for probably in excess of five years. So let's take a look at, um, at the Australian market. So first of all, the ASX 200. So a couple of very positive days on, um, on uh, Wednesday and again on, on Thursday, and that really uh, helped our market uh, claw back above the 6,000-point level. But if we pan back and take a bigger slice of data, you can see that it's still really not doing a, a great deal. Uh, this low here is 2009. Um, here's our all-time highs formed in 2007. Uh, we're still nearly a thousand points below the all-time highs, whereas the U.S. market is uh, is more than double its um, 2007 highs. And uh, whilst we've had a little look over this um, resistance level at 6,000, um, it's really struggling to um, you know to hold on to that. And one of the main reasons, of course, is is this: the banks. This is the uh, the Australian banking index. You can see that we've um, We've broken support. This was a, a key level here at 6,200. We're now down at 5,900. And, um, you know, the the uh, moving averages have rolled over. You can see the blue 50-day moving average line is diverging very quickly from the from the 200, which means that the, the price trend is accelerating to the downside. Uh, the price is well below the 50-day. Um, Yes, we might get a little bounce back to the 50. In fact, I think that's probably inevitable. But whether we get a bounce before we get another decline, um, you know, it's impossible to say. But you you have to conclude that the direction in the banking sector is down. And if we look at CBA, so this is CBA on a weekly chart. We've clearly broken support. We're, we're now at the lowest level uh, we've been at since uh, July of 2013, and um, it's uh, it's looking extremely weak. It's over it's oversold, so you know a bounce up into here. I wouldn't be looking at trying to buy into that, even though the media might try and influence you that now's the time to buy the banks. I just just wouldn't do it. Clearly, all the moving averages have rolled over, and um, I think lower prices uh, look extremely likely. 
there have been some very good uh, gains in quality small caps in the Australian market, though, uh, particularly in the uh, in the fintech uh, sectors, so the financial technology stocks. Have, uh, have been leading the way and other technology stocks and also a few healthcare stocks as well. So there certainly are, if you're very selective um, and you know you look hard, there are, um, there are some good uh, gains happening in the Australian market, but uh, very, very few of them in the, um, the top 50 or top 100 stocks. Uh, moving on to precious metals, gold was higher by $5, uh, just a tick under the, the 1300 mark. Um, but look, we've got a massive week coming up, um, you know, politically and uh, and economically. Uh, we've got this G7 summit that's just starting, um, and that's you know that's an informal group that uh, that basically sets the direction for um, uh, for the global economy. Uh, and we've now got this situation where it's quite possible that the U.S. Um, is going to be completely out of step with the other six countries, and as um, the uh, president of France said, "Well, there may be a, a vote by uh, by six countries. We don't necessarily need America, and if that were to happen, that would have enormous ramifications. Um, it would certainly uh, lead towards more instability in financial markets because it would create a lot of uncertainty. So, for me, that's one of the um, that's one of the potential concerns. It's potential concern only at this stage, but." If um, you know if Trump continues to disrupt, um, and you know if if he continues to disrupt things, then uh, there's really just you know no telling where this could lead. But hopefully, some common sense and negotiation will will prevail. Uh, we've got the Fed meeting, of course, on interest rates, but it's almost uh, a given that interest rates will go up another quarter percent. Uh, that'll be on Wednesday. Um, but the real wild card here, which is very much an unknown, is is the negotiations between the U.S. and North Korea, or well, not negotiations, but at least a, a meeting. Um, I think the first two, you can have a reasonable, educated guess at which way they're going to go. Um, but U.S. North Korea um, is is an absolute wild card. I don't think anyone has any idea how how that's going to play out. So um, certainly some things that can disrupt markets in the short term. But you've got to remember that the U.S. market is underpinned by um, a, a really good situation with their economy, corporate profits. Um, you know, there's a lot of reasons why uh, the market will continue to go up. Um, the U.S. market is fair value. It's um, it's certainly not undervalued, but it's not overvalued either. Um, so that's the bigger picture backdrop. Now, looking at precious metals. Um, there's really still nothing happening there at all, so probably not a great deal of point in looking at precious metals, to be honest. But just for the record, let's take a look at um, the gold price. So there's the gold price on a on a daily basis. So very little has happened since the middle of May, and if we look at it on a weekly, you, know, you can see really no change uh, since the week ending uh, the 18th of May. Uh, and if we take a look at GDX, uh, GDX, um, there's the close on the 8th of June. Um, you can see just really no uh, no movement going on there at all. Turning to other commodities now, uh, copper uh, rocketed higher to uh, $3.29, and that was largely on some concerns about uh, supply. Um, and the futures actually uh, were at their highest level since 2013 on, uh, on very large volume. So um, that, uh, that was a very, very positive week uh, for copper. However, I do note that the supply concerns are, are a lot about um, industrial action at uh, the Escondida mine in Chile. And of course, those things are ultimately get resolved you know, fairly, fairly promptly. So I think the supply concerns uh, are going to be resolved. It's not a structural uh, shortfall that's going to take um, you know, years to turn around. So I'd I don't think this price of copper up here is sustainable in the uh, in the medium to longer term. 
Now, crude oil uh, continues to decline uh, back down to 65.57, and that was largely about uh, rising inventories. Uh, energy stocks, though, appear to have stabilized, even though the crude oil is, uh, is still falling. Uh, let's just take a look at the energy index in America. So there is XLE. In fact, uh, XLE actually uh, went up during the week, not by a little bit, but it did go up. So that's really quite interesting that the energy uh, sector rose while crude oil is still falling. So that leads me to conclude that uh, crude oil's probably not got too much more downside in it from here because normally you, you do see stocks tending to lead the underlying commodity. Uh, you certainly see that in the precious metals market and uh, to a degree in oil. So there's the spot copper chart. Um, this is the highest level we've been at since uh, one little spike just before Christmas. Um, and there's crude oil has come off quite sharply from above 72. We're now down under 66. So that's over three months. If we look at it over 12 months, then you can see that um, we're still in a very, very strong uptrend. Uh, likely to be support here off this peak, which is at around 65. And, and that looks to have basically come down and hit that support level uh, through the week. At, uh, at probably around the 65 mark. So to wrap it all up, um, just what I think little sell-offs in the market are buying opportunities. Uh, really important to have a big shopping list because you, you want to let prices come to you. You want to be buying on your terms. So make sure you've, uh, you've got a big shopping list. If you don't have the time or the resources to develop it yourself, then, uh, you know, buy that, acquire that that big shopping list from from someone else, um, it'll uh, it'll pay you back in spades. Portfolio analyst this week, I'm um, going to be looking at opportunities in the U.S. financials, um, which I think are are undervalued. I think they've been left behind a little bit. Uh, technology is just going gangbusters. Uh, healthcare is starting to pick up. Um, many sections of industrials have been doing very well, but uh, U.S. financials haven't really moved up in the last uh, few weeks. So I think there's good opportunities there. And uh, there's also some, um, some more local opportunities that, um, that are coming up uh, as well. There's my contact details for those that uh, aren't members of one of my subscription services. And um, it's a huge week coming up. So I expect we'll probably see some volatility in the markets. And um, I'm uh, rubbing my hands in anticipation because I think there's some... Uh, there's some good opportunities can come up when uh, when a little bit of panic sets in. So I'll be back with you next weekend. Cheers.